It's October. So let's start off spooky month with a fun spooky movie, Clue, where we learn you need to be real careful which dinner parties you get invited to. I can attack so I cast. Clue is a classic example of a movie no one asked for. Now, in my neck of the woods growing up, Clue was a popular board game. My family played it a lot on game night. Funny though, most of my memories of playing Clue are as a teenager over at various friends' houses. The moms always coming in, bringing snacks, drinks, hanging around to watch the game, starting to give hints, and then at a certain point, halfway taking over the game. When word started to circulate that they were going to make a movie inspired by the game, the common reaction was, why? How? It's not like the game has a complicated backstory. Random group of people trapped in a mansion, and it's your job to figure out who whacked somebody in the library with a candlestick. Everybody's tune quickly changed once they saw the movie. Plus, you had the whole three endings thing. Depending on what theater you were in, you got to see the particular ending. Pretty clever. Six people, who are all being blackmailed, are invited to a dinner party at a remote mansion. The purpose of the dinner party? So that everyone can confront their blackmailer. Wadsworth the butler, played by the great Tim Curry, wants everybody to turn the blackmailer in. This would also entail handing over to the police evidence of their crimes. These are some very naughty people. The blackmailer says, huh, I have a better idea. He hands everybody a lethal weapon, gun, knife, noose, candlestick, lead pipe, pipe wrench. The blackmailer tells everyone, if you don't want the police to find out what you've been up to, someone here needs to silence a Wadworth over there permanently. And then he turns off the lights. Crash, bang, boom. When the lights come back on, Wadsworth is just fine. It's the blackmailer who's dead. And we're off to the races. As the evening progresses, the bodies keep stacking up. In the 1980s, there was a great deal of nostalgia for the 1950s. And is the human tendency, people were looking back on that time period with rose-colored glasses. Clue the movie rightfully points out the 1950s weren't all just sunshine and happiness. It had its problems. Problems we would do well to remember, not sweep under the rug in the name of nostalgia. There was the whole communist scare. Now, regardless of what actually was going on, one thing we can say for certain, in the midst of all the finger pointing and name calling, a lot of innocent lives were destroyed. Wadsworth tells us his wife was friends with <gasps> socialists. Oh, the shame. <laughs> After his wife refused to give up the names of her friends to Congress, the House Un-American Activities Committee, she took her own life. Now, the movie plays this part up for laughs, but it really did happen. So the point is well taken. Continuing with the theme of what is American versus what is un-American, we're told Mr. Body, the blackmailer, was enraged when he found out about the illegal activities of all these people. He believed what they were doing was un-American. When asked, well, why didn't he just turn us into the police then? Wadsworth tells everyone, he thought, why not make a buck off of what he knows? What could be more American than that? And everybody agreed, yep, yep, that's pretty American. That gets to another theme of the movie, corruption. The 1950s might have been a great time in American history, but it wasn't free of corruption. In particular, corruption within the halls of power. Growing up in the 1970s and 80s, we were constantly being warned, both from the American left and the American right, about the dangers of institutional power. More specifically, about the dangers of corruption seeping into institutional power. Colonel Mustard works for the Pentagon. He's helping develop the next nuclear bomb. But in his free time, he's busy hanging out at houses of ill repute. Professor Plum works for the United Nations Committee on Family Planning. He's also an incorrigible womanizer, hitting on every woman he comes into contact with. Professor Plum lost his professorship and his license to practice because he was busy sleeping with all his female patients. Mrs. Peacock is a senator's wife who sells her husband's vote to the highest bidder, including a foreign power. 
The implication is that foreign power is China. Mrs. White, all six of her husbands have died under mysterious and rather suspicious circumstances. Miss Scarlet, she's a madam who runs a house of ill repute that caters to the wealthy and politically powerful within Washington, D.C. Mr. Green works for the State Department. He's the only one depicted as doing nothing wrong. He's being blackmailed just because he happens to be gay. We'll come back to him in a bit, though. And then there's Yvette the maid. <laughs> wow. Yvette used to work for Miss Scarlet. That's when the pictures of her and Colonel Mustard in flagrante delicto were taken. Yvette also had an affair with one of Mrs. White's husband. It's also implied Yvette just might know Mrs. Peacock's senator husband in a biblical way as well. Yvette doesn't seem like she has a lot of free time. Every one of these people either walk the halls of power or cater to the halls of power. Even Mrs. White, whose last victim, I mean husband, was a nuclear scientist working on the next atomic bomb with Colonel Mustard. Wadsworth offers everyone a path to redemption. Turn yourselves into the police. Confess what you've done. Pay the price. You'll come out the other side, free to live your lives without this cloud hanging over you. Every single one rejected what Wadsworth was offering. Redemption. Instead, they chose murder. The movie also tells us that during the 1950s, there were two tiers of justice. The rules for you and me, and a whole different set of rules for the powerful and politically connected. The version where Mrs. Peacock is revealed to be the murderer, she pulls the gun on everybody, says, you take care of things, I'll leave, and backs out the door. Everybody says, oh no, she's getting away with it. Wadworth says, we already have her. Oh, by the way, I'm with the FBI. And everything that happened tonight, don't worry about it. We'll take care of all of it. Oh, we wouldn't want to upset the status quo, now would we? Everybody asks, what about the bodies? Wadworth says, don't worry, we'll clean those up too. And they ask, what? Is the FBI in the habit of covering up murder? Oh yeah, we do it all the time. Why do you think we're run by a guy named Hoover? In the other two endings, even with the one where five of the six guests murder someone, it's implied they will never face any consequences for what they've done in the past and what happened that evening. Four years, that's where my analysis of Clue would end. A fun, silly movie based on an old board game that would gently tweak the nose of power and reminded us all that every generation, every period in history had its problems. Here lately, with what's going on in the world these days, I'm starting to think Clue was trying to warn us of something a little more sinister going on. Who's Mr. Body, the blackmailer? The movie never tells us, but it does leave some very interesting clues. Mr. Body's not just randomly finding information that he could use to blackmail people. On the contrary, he's put together a rather sophisticated organization of people helping him gather information. And there's one thing that seems to be a nexus that he focuses on in order to get dirt on people. Sexual behavior. It's almost like he's running a honeypot operation. This honeypot operation has managed to rope people in from Pentagon, State Department, academia, research world, Senate. We come back to the question, who exactly is this guy? Well, in two of the endings, we find out he's just a front man. In the first ending, we learn Mr. Body's working for Miss Scarlet. Makes sense. She runs the bordello. She employs Yvette. It would be easy for her to gather dirt on all her clients and everybody they know. Miss Scarlet admits what she's doing is a honeypot operation, gaining control over people so she can learn their secrets and then sell their secrets to the highest bidder. Ending 3 reveals Mr. Body works for Wadsworth, and Wadsworth is up front in what he's doing as well. Yep, he's after secrets too. Ending 2 is not as clear. Mrs. Peacock kills everybody just to cover her own ass. But it would make sense if it was a honeypot operation in ending one and ending three, then it'd still be a honeypot operation in ending two. This is where things get interesting. And by interesting, I mean dark. In endings one and two, we learn Wadsworth was working for the FBI the entire time. That means the FBI had all the evidence of everybody's crimes. 
The FBI didn't go out and arrest everybody, put him in jail. On the contrary, they called a meeting. The FBI could have stopped the murders at any point. They had the mansion surrounded the whole time. Wadsworth tells everybody, don't worry, we'll cover all this up. No one will ever learn of your secrets. We don't want to disrupt the status quo after all. You all have to ask the question, what's the price for all of this? It looks like the honeypot operation is just going to continue on continuing on. The only difference, it's now under new management. The FBI now has a bunch of new assets that are going to be very malleable, willing to do anything the FBI tells them to. Pentagon, State Department, Academia, Research World, Congress. The third ending to the movie doesn't change much. The FBI still knew enough to get Mr. Green onto the blackmail list, knew enough to get him invited to the meeting. As far as the FBI is concerned, the outcome is the same. They're now in control of a honeypot operation and have a bunch of new, very malleable, very cooperative assets. If you all know your history, 1950s, bells should be ringing. Now, I'm not saying Clue was intentionally bringing up these particular topics, but as accurate as they were in talking about other things that happened in the 50s, makes you wonder. With what all we've been learning about here lately, Epps Diddy, Clue could have been written yesterday, past his prologue. Y'all don't need to think about all this darkness to enjoy Clue. It's just a fun parody of the classic murder mystery movie. I laugh every time I see it. Reminds me of growing up watching movies with the family on Friday nights. So much fun. At any rate, I hope I've given you all something to think about. And until next time, y'all be safe. If you're all still here, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. While you're at it, why don't you like this video, subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell. You can hear me yammer on about something else next time. And maybe consider becoming a channel member. Please like and subscribe. Please leave a comment.